What a powerful testimony. Well, this morning we're going to be opening up a new message series called uh, The Treasure Principles. And uh, The Treasure Principles is uh, about stewarding finances. Ooh. Stewarding finances God's way. Stewarding finances the biblical way. And I know, I know if I ask this question, how many of you believe in the supernatural power of God? All the hands would raise, correct? Yeah. Well, stewarding finances God's way taps into the supernatural power of God as well as the promises of God. And this morning, I just want to kind of be real with you because I know that this subject is very touchy for some folks. <laughs> um, how we handle uh, money. You know, if, I, if we bring up the subject of money in church, some people get offended. Some people get bent out of shape. Some people don't want to hear it. Uh, and so I want you guys to put on your seatbelt. And while you're doing that, I'm going to uh, protect myself too because uh, uh, I know some of you guys uh, throw some spiritual uh, tomatoes at me. Okay, so I got to do this for just for protection. All right? Because uh, I don't know, man, you know, some of you are giving me that look already. <laughs> but as I was preparing this message, um, God reminded me to not speak in extremes about money. Because I know that money is such a touchy subject for, for some people. And, and yet, at the same time, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. God speaks about love, heaven, joy, peace. And in fact, God speaks more about money in the Bible than any of those. Did you know that? And so this morning, as I was preparing the message, God was speaking to me and he said, Kent, be careful that you don't speak in extremes because sometimes churches, we can, we can speak in, in extremes. Of, of We go from one extreme of prosperity and then we go to the other extreme of poverty. God wants you to be rich. God doesn't want you to be poor. And so I want to make sure that I hit that, that fine balance, that just weight between the two extremes. Amen? And I also don't want to, to hype this subject up. God reminded me, just, can't, just teach it. Don't hype it. Because sometimes when we speak about money, then we can sometimes hype money. So God will say, no, Kent, don't hype it. Teach it. Because you know what? When the hype goes down, guess what? So I want to make sure that I just teach this subject. In the, in the Bible, in the book of Hosea, Scripture says this, My people perish for lack of knowledge. And I really believe that a lot of folks don't have the knowledge about stewarding their finances and stewarding or managing their finances God's way. And there are times when I spoke on, every year I speak on this message, and there are those that get offended. There are those that don't like what I say. Uh, but there are also those that come up to me afterwards and they say, well, thank you so much, Pastor Kent, for teaching us, teaching me about how to handle my money God's way. So there are people that also have been blessed by these messages about finances. They've experienced the blessings of God, and they've seen miracles happen in their area of finances, in their lives, in their family, in their, in their careers. And, and so I'm going to lean on the side of believing that God wants to do a miracle in your finances. Amen? Amen. So let's be real. Let's be practical. We all need money. Right? We all need money. The church needs money. You need money. Why? Because money is simply an, ex a, a simply a, an exchange, a, a medium of exchange for goods and services. We don't have money. We can't exchange it for any goods or services. So money is simply a medium of, of exchange for goods and services. But here's the thing. Money is very uh, interesting and it's very powerful because it's not just the money, it's your relationship with money. See, money is, is pretty powerful, and God uses money to, to, to touch and, and, and test our hearts. It's one area that God uses, and it's a very good area because sometimes when we speak about money, ooh, we feel it. I can speak about love, oh, I can speak about peace, oh, but when I speak about money, ooh, 
right? Money has some influence, impact. And it's, it's not necessarily about the money. It's about our relationship with money. Because to have money makes us feel a certain way. Isn't that right? Yeah. To not have money makes us feel a certain way as well. When we have money, we feel what? Secure. When we don't have money, we feel insecure. And so money has some power, some influence, some impact in our lives. So let's go there. Let's talk about money. Money is what God uses. It's one of the best tools that God uses to, to test the condition of our hearts. It tests our love. It tests our faith. It tests our trust. It tests our worship. It tests our selfishness, greed, covetousness, discipline, self-control. It tests our insatiable lust for more. It tests our, 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 our discipline, our, our everything. It even tests our, whether or not we have fear and unbelief. And a lot of times, we, I, it's really weird because we have a lot of believers with unbelief when it comes to money. Money has a way of tapping into areas in our hearts that we never knew that it was there. See, money is simply an object of exchange. It's a medium of exchange, but it's all the relationship, the feelings that it's attached to it. So this morning, I want us to activate the treasure principle. And more importantly, I want to talk to us about opening the windows of heaven. Amen? So are you ready? So here's, here's my overarching statement. We all own nothing. We don't own anything. Nothing. Zero. We don't own anything. Well, who does? Number one, would you write in your notes? Everything belongs to the Lord. Everything belongs to the Lord. We are only God's stewards, managers of what God gives us. This is not coming from me. It's coming straight from the Bible. The Bible says here in Psalms 24, verse 1, The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. The earth is the Lord's. Who owns the earth? The Lord. Who owns everything in the earth? The Lord. Here's another scripture. Everything. Would you circle that word, everything? Everything. Everything we have has come from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. So if everything belongs to the Lord, then He can give and He can take. Isn't that right? We cannot give what we don't own. Neither can we take what we don't own. But since God owns everything on this earth, He can give and He can take. Why? Because He owns it. He can, take, he can give us jobs. He can give us a home, a car. He can give us money. He can give us a church. He can give. Why? Because He owns it. He can also take it from us. He can take our jobs. He can take our health. He can take... Why? Because He owns it. God owns everything. Everything belongs to the Lord. Okay? So, if everything belongs to the Lord, <laughs> number two, the tithe is 10% of gross income, and it is the Lord's, it is holy. Are you still there? Okay, cool. Can I put this down? Okay, praise the Lord. Whew. The tithe is 10% of our gross income, and it is the Lord's. It is holy. So in other words, when it's your payday, it's God's payday. When we receive our pay due us, then we need to make sure that God receives His pay do him. Why? Because he's the one that gave us our jobs in the first place. Because he owns everything. The Bible says this. 
one-tenth the tithe or 10% of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. Would you underline that? Belongs to the Lord and must be set apart, underline that, must be set apart to Him as holy. Would you underline that? So we receive our paycheck, and within that paycheck that we receive, 10% of our gross must be set apart to the Lord because it is His. It is not ours. It is His. And when we set apart that 10%, that 10% is sanctified. It is set apart. That's why you are called saints. Saints comes from the sanctified. It is you are set apart for God's work. Same thing with that 10%. 10% must be set apart, sanctified, because that 10% is holy unto the Lord. Now watch this. You know how God tests our heart to see whether or not we put him first? To see whether or not he is our God, we trust God, we believe God. He gives us our whole paycheck with his 10% and he stands back and he watches us. What are you going to do now? What are you going to do? And if we're not careful, most people will take our entire paycheck and spend it on our stuff. Not realizing that 10% of our paycheck is really to be set apart and given unto the Lord. So when we spend everything of our paycheck on us, then the Bible calls that stealing because we just spend God's 10%. And so here's the thing. We got to make sure that we don't touch that which is holy. Amen? Believers, we tend to give God what is left, not what is right. And you do this. You, you, you sanctify your paycheck. You do. Remember now, sanctified means to set apart. You set apart a portion of your paycheck to pay your mortgage, to pay your car bills, to pay electricity, to pay for food, to pay for all these other things. So you're actually sanctifying. You are setting apart from your paycheck to, set, to, to pay for all these things. So what God is saying, okay, before you spend and you pay for all these things, you need to put me first. So sanctify, just like you do your mortgage, you set apart 10% to me. Are you guys getting this? I was at the gym, and uh, for some reason, every time when I go into the locker room, uh, there's always somebody there right next to my locker. It never fails. There's all these empty lockers, and, and there's nobody there, but this, it's always the case that every time I come there, this guy has to be there, right? And, uh, you know, and they're always in, a, in, in not the best dress kind of thing, and but I was, uh, I was getting my stuff, and um, he was sitting there, and he was, uh, you know, he was trying to open up his lock, and he was mumbling to himself. He was upset, and, you know, he was doing stuff, and I kind of turned because I could tell that he was upset. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, I cannot get my lock to open up. And I said, well, okay, well do you have the right number? He says, yes, I have the right number. And just as I said that, click. His lock opened, and he said something that stuck in my mind. He said, I had the right numbers, but I had the wrong order. He had the right numbers, but he put it in the wrong order, and that's why he couldn't open up his lock. It's the same thing with the tithe. We can have the, same, we can have the right number, but if we don't have the right order, the windows of heaven will not open up. See, 10% is right off the top. It puts God first. Puts God first. I remember this, uh, this, this story about this Filipino guy, this local guy from Hawaii, and this Japanese guy. They were stuck on this island. And um, they were looking at each other and said, Hey, how, how do you figure out uh, how to tithe, how to give God money? 
And so the Filipino guy, he thought about it. He said, oh, hey, that's, that, that's easy, that. Me, I, I, I throw my money up in the air. All my money, whew, I throw them up in the air. And all the money that, that fall outside their circle, that's what I give God. Then this local guy goes, ah, I get something better. Me, I throw my, all my money in the air. And all the money that falls inside the circle, that's what I give God. And then the Japanese guy, he hears that, he goes, ah, ah, I got better, better. Me, I draw a circle around. Me, I throw all my money in air. And the money that don't fall down, that's what I give God. <laughs> that's how some of us, we, <laughs> we give, we figure out what to give the Lord, you know? And see, the thing about it is, we need to make sure that we pay God first. Then we pay for all of our other stuff. Are you guys getting this? Because God wants to be first in our finances. Folks, I kid you not, if you want your finances to be blessed, put God first in your finances. In any area of your life that you want to be blessed, put God first. Amen? And see, the thing about it is we're not actually giving God we are returning to God. Would you write in your notes? We return the tithe out of our obedience, not out of our abundance. We return the tithe out of our obedience, not out of our abundance. See, when we give God, we're saying this is ours and I can give it to you. But the Bible says to return the tithe, meaning that that. That 10% is not ours, and so God tests our heart to see what we're going to do with it. And so we take the 10% and we say, oh, God, oh, your 10% is included in all. I'm going to return the tithe, the 10% to you. So it's not really giving. It is actually returning that which is already His. And we don't give out of our abundance. We give out of our obedience. I hear a lot of folks that say, oh, once... You know, once I get more money, once I get a better job, once I get the raise, then I'll give. Or once I hit the mega bucks, once I hit the jackpot, then I'll give. Then I'll give. But here's the thing. That's the wrong way to think. The right way to think is this. Be faithful with that which you already have. Be faithful with the little and God will give you more. It's not about how much you have, but it's about how much heart you have for the Lord. See, I know people in this church, I know people that everywhere, that some of them are retired, and you know that they still give, they still tithe. Young people, when they get their allowance, my son, Landon, when he was younger, he really touched my heart. I gave him a gift of 20 bucks, and he gave $2. I didn't know this until afterwards, but I said, Landon, why did you, this was for you. You know, don't worry about the tithe. He goes, no, Dad, I need to give. And you know, it really melted my heart to see my son honor the Lord. And because he did that, you know what Dad did? I gave him more. See, that's the God of our Father. When he sees us honoring when he sees that, it moves his heart. Because he doesn't need the money. He owns it all. But what he wants to see is our heart. And because I saw my son's heart, I was so open to blessing him with more. And that's how our God is. Amen? There's a story about this, uh, a widow, uh, and you may know it, about the widow's might. This widow was in the temple and Jesus was watching the people give into the treasury. And all these rich people were giving out of their surplus. But this widow, and it doesn't tell us the age of the widow, because a widow can also be young. A widow is just simply defined as no more husband. She doesn't have a husband. She didn't, she didn't have the moneymaker, because back then, the, the husbands, the men, were the moneymaker. And so she didn't have a source of income. I don't know whether she was young or old. But the Bible says a, a poor widow walked up to the treasure and put in two copper coins, with, which equals to a cent. 
two coins put together one cent. And the Bible says that she gave everything that she had to live on. And Scripture says this, that Jesus saw that, and he said, all these rich people put in out of the, their surplus, but this widow, this widow, not that widow, this widow. And when he said this widow, I can, I can imagine God closing in the distance on that widow and saying to his disciples, this widow. He pointed her out. Among all the others, what she did moved his heart because she gave not just her tithe, she gave over and above and beyond her tithe. She gave everything that she had. And isn't it so true? That's what God asks of us. He asks of us everything, our lives. Does it make sense? She didn't give out of her abundance because she didn't have a lot. What she did do was she gave out of her obedience. And because she gave out of her obedience, God, Jesus said, this woman to all of the disciples. He pointed her out. He elevated her, this woman. And I don't know about you, but I want God to say, you see this, this five foot four and a half Japanese guy? <laughs> That's something special when God points you out. Amen? Why is obedience so important? Well, here it is. Obedience brings blessings. Would you write that? It's not in your notes, but just write it on the side. Obedience brings blessings. Well, how do you know that, Kent? Well, it says so in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 2. Scripture says, you will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. Would you circle the word if and circle the word obey? If is a condition. If you obey. You don't have to. But if you obey the Lord your God, you will experience all these blessings. You want to know what all these blessings is? Read Deuteronomy chapter 28. That entire scripture will outline all the blessings that you will experience. You will experience. Not you may. You will. You will experience all these blessings. Another translation says this. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you. You'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the country. You'll be blessed in your travel, in your coming and your going. You'll be blessed in your bank account. Your children will be blessed. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Don't need to obey me. Obey the Lord your God. Why is that? Because I really believe, folks, that, that God wants to bless you when you need it the most. I believe especially when you need it the most. God wants to bless you. Why? Because God wants you to have a blessed and abundant life. Amen? You guys receiving this? So we tied. Hallelujah. I was going to put up my stuff because you know, right here. Okay. Not only that, we, in your bullet point, would you write, we tithe out of our heart. We don't necessarily tithe out of our wallet, our bank account. No, we tithe out of our heart. Watch this. When you love somebody, you don't mind spending money on the person. You don't mind giving to the person. Why? Because I love you. And if we say we love the Lord, then... Wouldn't it make sense that, hey, God, I want to give you back what's yours. I want to be a blessing to you. Isn't that right? We tithe out of our hearts. Now, my wife and I, both because we both work, we tithe out of our obedience. But here's, here's the thing. Here's the heart. We tithe because we love God. We tithe because he's been so faithful. We tithe because we want to tell God He is number one in our life. We tithe because we want to acknowledge Him as Lord over our life. 
We tithe because we want to tell God we're putting him first in our finances and you can trust us with finances. We tithe because we want to communicate to God how grateful and how thankful we are that we even get the opportunity to get paid because the Lord is our provider. He is the one that provides you the job he, because he owns it. He owns everything. So because he gave us this job that gives us a paycheck that's due, we are so thankful. Why? Because we've had seasons when we were not working. We weren't making an income. And so when we did, we say, Lord, all good things come from you. So when we did get this job, Lord, we thank you and we want to honor you and return to you your portion. We do that because we love God. It got really quiet. When you love somebody, isn't it so true? You, you know, you're trying to, you love your wife, so you don't mind spending money on her for Valentine's Day. Uh, that's a plug for the women, <laughs> right? When you love, it, it doesn't matter, right? So that's why we tithe out of our hearts. Now, some folks, they, they you know, in fact, last year I came off stage and I'm speaking about this, and uh, a person came up to me and said, um, but Pastor Kent, uh, tithing is Old Testament. It's Old Testament. And uh, I said, okay, um, well, let me point you, and this is what I told that person, let me point you to what Jesus says in the New Testament. Because Jesus is speaking to religious teachers, right? And, and uh, he says this, You are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Here it is. You should tithe. Yes. But do not neglect the more important things. Huh. That was in the New Testament. And so this person said, oh, tithing is in the Old Testament, and yet Jesus says in the New Testament, you should tithe, yes. But what he was saying is, don't neglect to love. Don't neglect to show mercy. Don't neglect to give forgiveness. Don't neglect to serve. Don't neglect the things of the heart, the matters of the heart. No, it's not an either or. It's an and. Because these folks were, were saying, oh, I tithe. So, and they were being very mean to the people. And, and Jesus says, no, 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 no. I, I see that you're tithing. Even from the littlest thing you tithe, that's good. But you're neglecting to love the people. You're abusing them. You're treating them unkind, unkindly. You're treating them bad. No, don't forget, this is the meteor part here. Do this, but yes, you should tithe. Are you guys getting this? Here's another scripture in the New Testament. The Pharisees asked Jesus, should we pay taxes to, to Caesar? And Jesus responds, says, well, uh, show me a coin. And they brought Jesus, a denarius, which was what they called the coin back then. And, on, and they said, who, who's, whose face is on the, that coin? And they said, Caesar's. Now watch what Jesus says. Pay to the emperor what belongs to the emperor. And pay to God what belongs to God. Would you underline that? When they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. What the tithe belongs to who? The tithe belongs to who? The tithe belongs to God. In the New Testament, Jesus says, pay to God what belongs to God. So tithing is not only in the Old Testament, it is also in the New Testament. Ooh, this is good stuff. Number three. So when you return the tithe, number three, God, the Lord of hosts, responds. God, the Lord of hosts, responds. Malachi 3.10, Bring all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, 
says the Lord of hosts. Underline the Lord of hosts. If I, circle I, will not open for you, well, here's it, here it is, the windows of heaven, underline the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. The Lord of hosts. I love that title, the Lord of hosts. When you go to a restaurant, who greets you? The host. Who seats you? The host. The Lord of hosts will open up. He says, I. See, there are windows in heaven that you cannot open up, but he will for you. There are things that you cannot do on your own, but he will do it for you. And when you tithe, God, the Lord of hosts, will respond to your giving your tithe, your returning your tithe. The Lord, will, the Lord of hosts will open up the windows. He'll open up the doors of opportunities that you could not open. He'll open up divine interventions. He'll give you the edge. He'll give you the advantage. He'll give you the promotion. He'll open up the doors. Why? Because he has friends in high places. And, and would you write this in your bullet point? God opens the windows in high places. The windows of heaven are in high places. Remember Noah? The Bible says that God opened or opened the floodgates. It's the same word, the floodgates, windows, same word. That which the, the Lord opened up flooded the earth. Now God wants to open up the floodgates to bless you. The word windows is the Hebrew word aruba. Pretty cool, huh? Aruba. Aruba. The root word is Arab. Interesting. That root word from Arubaba means to lurk or lie in wait to ambush. You know what that means? God is lying in wait to ambush you with such blessings. He's lying. He's looking out the windows of heaven and I believe the windows of heaven aren't those small windows. And in fact, I was, I was thinking, Lord, why did you use windows? Why not doors? And God said, Kent, look at your house. How many doors do you have? Two? Look how much windows you have. Oh, yeah, I got plenty of windows. <laughs> God is saying, I'm gonna, I, I want to open up all these windows, these big windows. These big windows. Why? To ambush you. He's looking out all of these windows and he wants to ambush us with blessings. You know how that works? See, God is unlimited, right? We are limited. And we tend to think that our income comes from our jobs. That's one limited thinking. But because God owns it all, his channel of provision is unlimited. There are time, there were times in my life that, um, you know, my wife and I weren't drawing a, 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 you know, we were drawing an income, but it was really small. But God spoke to people, I didn't even know, people would come up to me and say, hey, Kent, God placed you on my heart for some reason, and I really want to bless you. And they would give us, like, money. I was like, Wow, God, you are so good. You are so good. And see, that's the blessings of allowing God to use us as channels of His blessing. He'll speak to people to bless you. You thought that your income was going to come from your job. But you know that God can speak to that, the government, the, 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 the and, get, and get resources to you. I've heard people that found checks in the mail from the government, how's that? Government returning money to you. That's a miracle. <laughs> See, here's the thing. In your bullet point, which you write here, God wants to open up the windows of heaven. Why? Because heaven's currencies can be released and poured out. Heaven's currencies. Listen, there is not going to be money as you know it in heaven, but there, there are heaven's currencies. Heaven's currency is like joy, peace. Heaven's currency is like ideas, divine strategy. Heaven's currency is like favor from high places. How many of us want God's favor? 
Oh, yeah, we want favor. Listen, there are things that you cannot do. There are things in your life or you look at your life and you say, I could never, but you know one favor of God in high places can move you to the next level? See, when God opens the windows of heaven because of your obedience to the tithe, he'll give you favor from high places. He'll take you places that you, ha- you thought that you could never go. He'll bring you to a place in life when you look back and you go, how in the world did I get here? It's because of your obedience. It's because you have, have returned what was God's, and now God is responding. The Lord of hosts is opening up the windows of heaven and pouring out favor. He's pouring out His joy. He's pouring out His peace that surpasses all understanding. Heaven's currencies, folks. Let me give you perspective. Let's say you had cancer. And let's say God says, okay, I'm going to give you a choice. I'll give you a million dollars tangible or I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out heaven's currencies of healing. Which one would you want? I would want healing, heaven's currencies. I will give you a million dollars or I will give you peace that surpasses all understanding in your family. Which one would you want? I want heaven's currencies. You see that? You know that the world is kind of trippy because there are a lot of rich people that can say, I have money. But really, money has them. There are a lot of rich people that have a lot of money but they have no heaven's currencies, no joy, no peace in their life. Isn't that right? And yet, at the same time, I've also seen poor people that didn't really have a lot of money, but they have a lot of heaven's currencies, full of joy, full of hope, full of peace, full of purpose. You see that? And God wants to open up the heavens so that He can pour out Heaven's currencies not only provide you with, yes, finances and stuff, but more importantly, it's all of these heaven's currencies that are more valuable. Why? Because heaven's currencies are not temporal. They are eternal. Amen. Do you guys receive that? Hallelujah. Would you all stand? Praise the Lord. I didn't need this. Hallelujah.